Hey everybody, Brian Zane here with a short little message before you ask me. Yes, this is a re-uploading of my original No Holds Barred review from last year. It was taken down a couple of months ago on YouTube. It was blocked by WWE due to copyright violations. I tried fighting it. It didn't work. And so now I'm just going to re-upload the video again with some minor cosmetic changes that I was dinged for in the first place to hopefully fly under the radar this time. If you've seen this video before, by all means, you don't have to watch it again. If you want to try and catch the small change I made to the original one to put it back up here, by all means you can look for it there but if you haven't seen this video before enjoy you know folks let's face it life is rough there's war death poverty famine reality television our heroes are dying and the ones who are still alive usually live on to become disgraced but despite all that folks there's still one thing we as a society can rely on the magic of movies. Yes, folks, they say it every year at the Oscars, and it holds true today. Movies are a wonderful thing. They make us laugh, they make us cry, they make us think, they make us feel. Movies can teleport us to wonderful worlds, and, uh, oh, well, <laughs> look at this. I happen to be waiting in a pile of wonderment right now. Let's see here. Uh, okay. All right. Oh, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> look at this. <laughs> Isn't this appropriate? No Holds Barred was released in June of 1989, the first major film vehicle for Hulk Hogan since Rocky III. The WWF's top guy plays an even more idealized version of himself, taking on a corrupt TV executive and a senseless ass-kicking machine, all while fighting for the honor of his family and friends. Sounds good on paper, but by the end of this review, you'll understand why Vincent Mann and Hulk Hogan should have never been allowed back into Hollywood in the first place. Our story begins with a horrifying visual of the grunting, slobbering champion Rip, played by the Hulkster, as he makes his way to the ring to fight his challenger. Rip is accompanied to the ring by his trainer Charlie and his younger brother Randy. According to Mean Exposition Oakland, Rip and Randy have never been closer since the death of their parents. Okay, I know it's a movie, but how can these two possibly be brothers? I mean, was one of them adopted? Are they half-brothers, step-brothers? Was Randy a happy accident years after Rip was born? There's no way these two are related. Could you ever find a more lopsided-looking pair of brothers? You know, Billy, even though our parents are dead, we're still brothers. Our bond is stronger than ever, Snarl. That's right. Now my pre-workout's kicking in. I gotta go do some chest and tries. I'm gonna shop for model trains on eBay. Even though Rip's catchphrase of rip em isn't that brilliant, his trademark hand gesture is certainly unique. I guess the thumbs up and the hang ten were, uh, trademarked? Rip's success catches the eye of rival network head Tom Brell, played by Kurt Fuller, whose other work includes playing Brell and Brell. Brell's known for two things in this movie, chewing the scenery and talking the way no other human being talks. I refuse to grow old waiting for Rip to ride off into the sunset. But every time this jockass Miss Tidings, take a leak. <gasps> Desperate for ratings, Brell demands that his network claim the rights to Rip, but somehow not the federation he works for, which is so not how this works. This sells. This is what people want. And we're gonna pound this into your head for the next 30 years! Brell brings Rip into his office to negotiate a deal, but Rip only has his balls and his word, and he doesn't break it for anybody. Are you trying to tell me my money's not good enough for you? I find that a little hard to swallow, you jockass! <laughs> oh my god! Rip emphatically rejects the proposal, only to find himself being kidnapped by a crooked limo driver on Brell's payroll. In the struggle, Rip manages to force the limo to swerve around by kicking the door. Damn, his legs have got to be super strong to be able to move two tons of steel like that. Makes you wonder why in this movie his finisher is the axe handle and not, I don't know, the leg drop? A pack of goons waits to lay into our hero, who manages to make the roof of the limo explode! Okay, you don't get that strong from taking your vitamins. Rip easily disposes of the goons, then focuses attention on the limo driver, who, now that I think about it, looks suspiciously like actor and comedian Richard Belzer. Which may not mean much, until you remember back in 1985, Belzer sued Hulk Hogan for millions of dollars after an incident on Belzer's talk show when Hogan made him pass out in a headlock. So consider this classic moment some serious Hogan wish fulfillment. 
What's that smell? <laughs> you know, it's encouraging to know that poop jokes have always been hilarious to Vincent Mann. The film moves on as if Rip's life wasn't just in danger, and the champion is introduced to his new account executive, Samantha. Samantha and more. Okay, well, if Samantha and more isn't the lamest attempt at a Bond girl name I've ever heard, I don't know what is. I really have no idea what Sam is saying in this scene because I can't stop paying attention to Rip eye-humping the daylights out of her. Item one, merchandising. Mr. Reynolds and I agree. Hmm, I'd sure like to be videotaped having sex with her without my knowledge. Instead of slapping the bejesus out of him, Sam has dinner with Rip at a restaurant that used to be a church? But I'm afraid that Monsieur is looking for the hamburger American or the Outland hot dog. Wow, could that Mater D be a little more annoying? I think I'd be able to tolerate him a lot better if it weren't for that obnoxious French accent. <laughs> Zut alors! Did somebody say obnoxious French accent? Whoa, Claude, eccentric French supermodel. Man, I haven't seen you since, like, 2013. What have you been up to lately, man? Well, you know, things are very busy for an international supermodel like myself. I have traveled the world. I have appeared on many magazine covers. I have adopted many of the small children. I have started and stopped many diets. Also, I have been secretly sabotaging Tyler Breeze's career out of jealousy. None of that is true, is it? No. Well, except for the part about Tyler Breeze. I really hate that guy. Claude, you're the lamest character ever. I know. I am model! Meanwhile, at the local underground dive bar slash fight club slash tattoo parlor, Brel and his cronies, one of whom looks almost exactly like Ken Rosenberg from Vice City, soaks in all the action of bare-knuckle brawling. Yeah, but what about the rules? Rules? Last one standing wins. Just don't kill nobody. Them's the only rules. Hey, look, it's legendary wrestler Stan Hansen in a role that lasted about as long as his entire run in the WWF. What, what do we got here? A teeny wing. Brel is inspired by the gladiatorial carnage and creates the Battle of the Tough Guys. You can see here the ring they're using is actually eight sides. So there you have it. The history books will read that Vincent Mann bankrolled ECW and helped inspire the Octagon in the UFC. I mean, complain all you want, fanboys. Proof's right there. Things are going well enough for Brel's project when the proceedings are interrupted. Enter Zeus, who you can tell is a big old badass because of all the fog and lights that surround him. After assaulting a female stagehand, because hey, it was the 80s, the Z gangster clears house in the gruntiest manner possible. <laughs> Brel appears to be aroused by this for some reason, while Rip and his trainer Charlie are horrified. Way back, I was his trainer for a while, but I, I just couldn't control him. And then I heard he killed some kid in the ring after the bell. Brel's new show is a rating smash, while the media ponders, is Zeus a thriller or a killer? Well, I'm pretty sure we just established he's the latter of the two, so... Sam and Rip hit the road and go on a business trip to somewhere. It's not important. Don't ask questions. They make a stop at one of Rip's favorite diners when suddenly... Out of my way! Move! Hands on the counter where I can see you! When I move, hit the floor. Come on, I'm playing a game here! Everybody hit the floor! <laughs> I'm not sure how these robbers didn't see Rip getting up to attack them. It's not like he isn't the biggest guy in the room, dressed in a way that even space aliens would find gaudy. Hey, do you wanna party? You know, there's something beautifully ironic about this scene. It's got Hulk Hogan with a Hank Williams Jr. song underneath. Just a couple of guys whose careers were ruined by saying dumb stuff about black people. But Rip isn't done as he assaults the would-be robbers with pies! Pies! By God, pies! Sure, that seems appropriate at a time like this. Can't wait for the movie where John Cena flashes the OK sign after thwarting a bank robbery. Rip and Samantha arrive at the motel to discover they have to share a bed. And then the movie presents a seemingly endless montage of the two of them pressing their ears to the door and practicing good oral hygiene. Mm. 
Can, can we just go back to people punching each other, please? Whoa, sounds like the Hulkster might be doing a little solo sex tape. Don't wait up for me. Ah, oily Hogan ass! God, I take back everything I ever said about Mr. America! Please, just no more of that! Somehow during all this madness, Sam has grown increasingly smitten for Rip. I mean, how can you ignore all this blatant flirtation and sexual tension? You build bigger walls than I ever could. There's a couch in the lobby that has a better sense of humor than you do. <sighs> we find out that Sam has been under the employ of Braille this whole time for some reason. When I asked you to seduce him, you just couldn't. Now that you've got the hots for him, you just can't. I guess the idea was Sam was supposed to seduce Rip and convince him to sign with Braille, but that's a bit of a leap. I didn't think it was possible, but we found a twist that makes less sense than Sasha's heel turning ready to rumble. Don't. <laughs> Get back here! You owe me! No, no, don't bother chasing her out or stopping her or anything. Just let her go. So instead of, you know, going to the cops or something dumb like that, Sam runs to Rip, admits she was a pawn in Brel's game, and asks for forgiveness. I forgive you, Sam. The hotel is sending you a bill for breaking the bed. <laughs> yes, a little humor always lightens the mood after your girlfriend gets pimp slapped by your enemy. As Sam and Rip begin to canoodle, the coincidental broadcast trope invades the film. It's here to be here. <laughs> a challenge. You looking at me or him? Me? Him? I, I, I can't tell. Rip doesn't want to stoop to Zeus's level and declines the challenge, but Brel continues to terrorize Rip and the ones he cares about. Mr. Brel has a party time! Oh no! Sam's being assaulted! If only Rip could conveniently show up on his motorcycle even though it looks like he's miles away! Oh there he is! Rip violates the goon with the front end of his motorcycle, then sends him flying headfirst into a tree, presumably to his death. He's asleep. No, he, wait, what? God, I hate it when you're hurt. Or scared. So just don't be anymore, okay? Quick sidebar, why is Brel still so obsessed with Rip at this point? I mean, he wanted to sign Rip to a contract because he wanted the ratings that Rip would bring. But now with the Battle of the Tough Guys, he doesn't need that anymore. He has his own Rip in Zeus. Is Brel that comically insecure and proud that he would make one man's life a living hell for having the audacity to say no? Clearly this man was inspired by one of the film's executive producers. We cut to another Tough Guys taping where Rip's brother Randy sees Zeus in action. <laughs> Did he just bury Horowitz himself? After the fight, Brill and Zeus send a message to Randy's brother. <laughs> okay, Fuller, you really have to find the line between looking evil and looking turned on, because you've already crossed the line more than once in this movie. With Randy hospitalized, Rip storms into Zeus's private gym. Among the accommodations is a recording that's played on an endless loop of Brill motivating Zeus in a sadistic manner. You hear Zeus? Rip said the maggots will gag on your rotten flesh. Now that I think about it, this must be how they got someone to write the film in the first place. Did you hear? Fans and critics say the worms are too good for your screenplay. They say the story has lots of holes and that the characters are really, really underdeveloped. Now what are you going to do about it? Ah, <sighs> I'll show them underdeveloped. I guess the network's making enough money they can afford to have a Zeus hologram coming out of a slide projector. This has to be the point where the movie just ran out of money. A cardboard cutout would have been more convincing, albeit more expensive, than Tiny Lister just trying to hold a pose. But hey, how could they have money for a decent hologram effect when it's obvious they dumped all their special effects money into SPARKS! SPARKS! LOTS AND LOTS OF SPARKS! Rip finally accepts the challenge after Zeus and Brel make it personal. While Rip spends the bulk of his time before the match helping Randy in rehab, Zeus trains by punching frickin' cinder blocks! <laughs> sorry, sorry, got a little... Carried away there, excuse me. Uh, he also trains by using a rowing machine, and, um... You know, that's boring. Back to the cinder blocks! <laughs> yeah! <sighs> it's time for the big fight. Brel stacks the odds by having his goons kidnap Sam and uses her as leverage. Make it look good. 
for 10 minutes. Then you go down. Whoa, brother, you must not know Hulk Hogan's M.O. He doesn't lay down for anybody, Jack. It's the moment you've all waited for. The big fight, just at the front of the DVD cover says, No ring, um, no ref, uh, no rules? The combatants make their way to the ring. First Rip, then Zeus. White Ranger Tiger Power, White Ranger Tiger Power. <laughs> Jeez, I wonder if he felt that. Okay, that line actually made me laugh. Eventually, Sam is able to escape the dumbest security detail in movie history. Until she doesn't. Until she's saved by the trainer from Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. As the fight goes on, they keep punching. And 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 hey, look! Sparks! Lots of sparks! After a predictable Hogan-like comeback, Rip finally defeats Zeus, who channels his inner wily Coyote. Our hero then turns his attention to Brell, as the crowd definitely seems to be all for a hapless TV executive getting beaten to a pulp. Stay away, you jockass! <laughs> Damn, this crowd is bloodthirsty. A guy just died while doing a silly dance. Rip celebrates the hard-fought victory with his brother, then teleports to the arena from the first scene for some reason, freeze frame, and fade to black. And that was No Holds Barred. And you know, it's not the absolute worst I've ever seen, but uh, it's close. No Holds Barred is the epitome of the WWF in the 1980s. It's Hogan at his most Hogan, always the squeaky clean do-gooder, that is when he's not giving his female co-star all sorts of creepy looks. With an over-the-top collection of villains gunning for him, all done away with the power of good! It's super cheesy when watching it now, but it worked perfectly well for the time. Kurt Fuller as Brell is the clear MVP of this film, but everything else about the movie is terrible. The story, the rest of the cast, the editing, and the audio, this is a film that has not aged well. But the summer of 89 was not the end of No Holds Barred Mania. To coincide with the film's release, Zeus himself debuted on WWF television, treated as though his fictional character actually existed, and feuded with Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan! B.D. Bumper! Boy, I can't believe some people back then still thought wrestling was real. Giving credit where it's due, the WWF did an excellent job hiding Tiny Lister's weaknesses since he wasn't actually a wrestler. They kept him true to his movie character by no-selling everything and doing little else but punches and bear hugs. He never had a true one-on-one -on -one fight with Hogan, instead being protected in tag matches partnering with Randy Savage or on Ted DiBiase's Survivor Series team where he got himself DQ'd early on. As cheesy as it was, the stuff Hogan and Zeus did on TV was far more compelling and fun to watch than the movie itself. Maybe it's because Hogan never had to cry in front of the guy on TV, or be seen doing oily push-ups, OH GOD NEVER AGAIN! Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, comment below, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane and I- uh, Okay. I'm Brian Zane and I- I'm Br- I- Okay, you know what? I'm trying to do a show here. God. Hey, do you mind? I'm trying to... Oh, God. <sighs> Hello again, Mr. Zane. You could say it's been a while. What are you doing here? What do you want? It's time to play the game, and it's time to end this. Bye! What a dick.